Welcome to the Shepherd's Pie, a slice of hope to raise faithful kids, where we focus on topics that impact young people today. I'm Antony Barone Kolenk. I'm a father of five who served in the Air Force for 21 years. I'm now a law professor and a columnist for Practical Homeschooling Magazine. I'm also the author of The Harwood Mysteries, an inspirational medieval fiction series for kids aged 10 and up. Here on The Shepherd's Pie, we want to inform, inspire, and help you to raise happy, healthy, faithful kids, whether you're a homeschooling mom or dad, a grandparent, a teacher, anyone. In today's episode, we talk about teenagers and self-worth. My guest is Candice Pedraza Yamnitz, a homeschooling mom and the author of the young adult fantasy novel Unbetrothed, where her main character struggles with issues of feeling ungifted. And in the entertainment segment of the show, my guest reviewer Carrie Schmidt discusses the middle grade novel The League and the Lantern by Brian Wells. You know, we hear a lot about self-worth with our kids and teenagers, especially how they struggle to find their identities, to determine what gifts God has given to them, to embrace who they are as a person. I remember even myself growing up, that was always an issue. And having kids, you see it. They search for their identity, trying to figure out why am I here and what is my worth? Do I have any special gifts? Those themes are often mentioned in books for young adults and teenagers today. It's a theme that I really bring up in my Harwood Mysteries books. Even though we have medieval teenagers there, they're looking at that age-old question, what does God want from my life? Am I special? Do I have my own unique self-worth? And how do we as adults interacting with them now talk about those issues? How can we relate to them in such a way where they can think about those matters and be open to some self-reflection on it. Well, I find that writing fiction and reading fiction is a wonderful way to connect with them. And that's why I'm so excited in our interview segment to talk with Candice Pedraza Yamnitz about her unbetrothed novel, where her main character really struggles with that exact issue. Today I am with Candice Pedraza Yamnitz. She is a homeschooling mom and the author of the young adult fantasy novel Unbetrothed, which was released in February 2022. And in that book, her main character struggles with issues of self-worth. She taught in a bilingual elementary education classroom for years, and she also served in her church's youth group with a focus on teenage girls. She lives in Chicago with her husband and her three children. Candice, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me, Tony. So you have a fascinating background with teaching. I see that you did some teaching and some homeschooling. Uh, Tell us a little bit about yourself. I've grown up in Chicago. I became a bilingual teacher. I started teaching first grade, then I taught third, fourth, and I stopped teaching because I had my daughter. I decided I wanted to homeschool when she got old enough. All right, wonderful. So Unbetrothed is your debut novel. Can you tell us a little bit about what inspired you to write? Honestly, when I was growing up, I didn't read really that much. I didn't really like reading. I liked stories. I always told stories. And when I became a Christian in high school, I started reading the Bible and I was just really interested. I read the whole New Testament and I was like, okay, what do I do next? So I decided to start reading Lord of the Rings and I fell in love with fantasy and with reading. It's like, oh, these are all great stories. Read Pride and Prejudice. This is great too. And um, after that, I fell in love with reading, ended up being an English minor. I really didn't have it in my head necessarily to write yet. But then I had my babies. And of course, there's nursing and you're sitting there and you're like, okay, I have all this time that I'm just sitting here in the middle of the night. I started to start reading some YA novels and I was just gobbling them up. I also started serving in youth group. I was like, wait a second. I'm like, I don't really like these messages or, you know, this story is great, but I want something different. I'm not seeing the story I want to see. So, of course, I was just like, okay, I'm going to write my own book and very naive thinking it would be something easy, right? Because it's super easy to write 85,000 words. And uh, I soon learned it was quite a challenge, but I don't know, God was good throughout the whole process. And that's how I ended up writing Unbetrothed. And I wrote like maybe six other manuscripts as well. 
Those are two of my favorites you mentioned along the way, Lord of the Rings and Jane Austen. All right, so what is the premise of Unbetrothed? So Unbetrothed is about a snotty princess who is ungifted while everyone else in her kingdom is gifted. She feels like, okay, she's inadequate. So she tries to compensate and her compensation obviously hurts other people. She goes through a character arc where she discovers her worth and also her ability to contribute and to be part of her society. You know, it's funny that you started off calling her a snotty princess because mm -hmm. it's so in it's so important to have interesting characters and characters that have a place to go and people can relate to. So she's unlikable, which makes her very challenging to write. And she has a lot of qualities, I think, that are very relatable to people. I think um, she's easily relatable because she feels inadequate and she tries to compensate by making herself more important. And I think a lot of us can struggle with inadequacy at different points in our life. When I wrote this story, I was struggling with that as a stay-at-home mom and with the two kids by that time when I was writing this one. I also saw that my youth group girls, that some of them were struggling with that too. You know, sometimes it doesn't come out the best when you're struggling with it. You um, try to compensate or you try to make yourself look better. But I try to put little things in there like that, like ways that you compensate. I know a lot of my art readers were like, okay, she's unlikable, but for some reason I relate so much to her. Um, I definitely have those thoughts before. She has a maid. So another fun thing about the story is she has a maid who is very perky and she just clashes so much with Beatrice. And as they go on, it's showing their relationship and their growth and how they kind of grow each other by what they do in the story. I know as a writer, it is tough when you have to write an unlikable protagonist because you want the audience to root for your protagonist. I have a manuscript in my drawer which has not survived editing yet where I wrote a, a female character who was unlikable at first. Yeah, my beta readers, well, we don't really like her. Um, so Princess Beatrice, who's your main character, sounds like she is living, is, is this in a fantasy kingdom? Or can you tell us a little bit about the setting? Yes, it's tropical, it's fantasy, there's castles, kingdoms. I came up with this whole history in my head and then I typed out half of it, which when I say half of it, I mean, there's probably 80,000 words like background knowledge written for this book. I kind of wanted it to be in its own world. I didn't want to write it in the real world. And I wanted something that wasn't necessarily medieval because I've read medieval and I love them. Absolutely love them. But I wanted it to have like a Spanish flair because I'm Hispanic and I like different portions of our culture. And I'm like, that would be kind of cool to have it in there. Just and it'd be different too. I had a lot of fun with it. And also um, I have there being the ancient one who's in the story, who gives them their gift. And this is probably the only part of the story that's allegorical, which is the portion where there's the ancient one, he gives them their gifts. There's a person who it goes through. And as she's going through the story, those gifts are meant to be for the kingdom and for the, for the benefit. And she's supposed to use them for that, but she doesn't have one or she feels she doesn't have one. And I felt like that so many times. I'm like, what gift did God give me? And like, how can I be actually like giving to the church in this way? And that part, I think, was probably the only allegorical part. And it's kind of interwoven into the setting. You know, it sounds like Disney stole part of your idea for their latest movie, Encanto. Did you see that? I have not seen Encanto. And my husband and I joke around about it. That's why I laugh. What do you hope that teens will take away from this story? I hope that they take away that their self-worth isn't in what they do. It isn't in how nice they are. It isn't in how beautiful they are. It isn't anything of how they look. It's already there. God gave it to them. He made them in their mother's womb. Um, he made them exactly the way they are for whatever reason. And they have everything they need, honestly, for their worth. It's, it's just there and it's inerrant. So actually, I was doing a little bit of more research on it just because I'm like, okay, I'm just making sure that I am spot on and this is biblical and I've done research on it and everything. And everything that I'm seeing is like our worth should be found in God and our relationship to God. And as I'm going through scripture, I see that he said, talks about the sparrows and the lilies of the field. And he's like, aren't we worth more than that? I see that um, we can do anything through him. I mean, he's given us everything, like our gifts and the things that he wanted to make. He made us exactly the way we are. And he is going to use us in that way. And he'll strengthen us when we need it. So I hope that when girls come out reading this, they're like, okay, I can relate to this. And I could relate that God will give me the gifts when I need them. And do you, are you able to take those types of passages and somehow translate them into your world building that you've done with this ancient one and all that? 
when I talked to readers, a lot of them did pick that up. Some people didn't. And, you know, I made a story to be fun. I hope it was fun. I mean, I see um, other people, they said they've enjoyed it and they felt like they went on a little adventure with me. They went to the waterfalls, had fun climbing them and everything. So I wanted it to be fun and also share a message. And some people seem to pick up on it right away. Other people, they don't necessarily pick up. And I think that's fine either way. But I wanted something that was good for Christians, teens to read and to enjoy and hopefully to get the message. And if they don't get the message, I hope they had a fun adventure with seeds planted. Now, you've worked a lot with youth, and so you've probably seen some of these self-worth issues up close and personal. Can you talk a little bit about how you see our our current generation and where are they struggling with self-worth? I think that they're like, you know, do we fit in this crowd or that crowd? Um, Why do I feel off? inside. And I feel like with self-worth, if we go back to the Bible and we go back to that, we just, we're human. God made us, we're human, we're made in his image, that that'll be, that's the basis. And I mean, I think even in in a secular crowd, they can notice that self-worth is just, you have to have that down, that you have worth, you are human, you have worth. And now we can get to self-esteem, which is the way that we're interpreting our worth, the way that we are thinking and perceiving it and feeling it. Now, self-esteem, you can go up and down and whatnot, but if we have the self-worth portion and the truth in our head and it is set in stone, it's easier to get back to what we need to go. I see in our generation, they're finding worth in different crowds, maybe crowds that, you know, as parents were just like, okay, I don't want them in that crowd, but that crowd is giving them identity. I'm hoping that in our generation that we'll be able to go back to the Bible and see that we have the truth and the truth is very important. And it's important that we get our foundation and worth from there. You know, it's so interesting you talk about identity because I think you're right, and especially now, you know, this this whole identity push, I mean, I guess it's always been part of the teenage experience, but now in the age of social media, it just seems like the need to have to hook into particular groups uh, seems stronger even than when I remember when I was a kid. Um, are you seeing that in, in your teens that you work with? Well, I see that they can't necessarily leave their school crowd. Compared to before, when I went home, I was home. I didn't have to worry about what people are saying in front of everyone else at home. But right now when students come home, they have Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, things can get spread around in more easily and they can't necessarily leave that social crowd anymore. There's no break from it. Are you able to take any of that kind of an issue with identity? I mean, how do you translate that into Princess Beatrice and her life? Do you have any examples from your story of some instances where Princess Beatrice sort of has to deal with these self-worth issues? Well, at the beginning of the story, you see first the scene where she's a little girl and she doesn't receive her gift and it's just completely heartbreaking. And then she moves on when she's older and she's terrible towards her maid. And she's sitting there struggling with like, I don't want to go through with trying to find a person to betroth. I want to have choices and whatnot. So through that whole process, you can see that other people, when they're speaking against her and saying, oh, she's ungifted and she's unbetrothed, how she's handling that. And she's not handling it very well. And she thinks she needs this one thing. So she's kind of obsessing over this one thing, but she's like too scared to go out for it. That's how I handle it. Just that feeling of not being wanted and not being good enough. You've mentioned the Bible a few times. You've mentioned your faith. How are you able to work scripture into the story here? So, I mean, I have her praying and it's with the ancient one. And at some point in the story, in the middle, she's praying again. And this is finally when she is finally humbling herself. Like, okay, fine. I realize that I'm kind of messed up here. I think that's a very Christian thing. So, I mean, that's where it works in that I am a Christian. I'm writing this. The lessons are, they're meant to be for a Christian crowd. But I'm like, I also wanted to be enjoyable for a non-Christian crowd that they can read it. And maybe they'll see the Christian aspects of it. Maybe they won't. And I also don't want to preach to people. Like, I think that's like another thing that's big. You don't want to preach. You want to tell a fun story and people to gather like, okay, this is what she means by that. Okay, I can see myself there. So um, that's how I work it in as best as I can. Obviously, it's imperfect because I'm imperfect, but I tried my best. I was prayerful. I know God's opened doors for me and he continues to open doors for me to keep on creating art that's for him and through him because I was it was prayerfully done. And it's as best as I can as a human. No, I think you're right. By setting it in the fantasy world, and you mentioned Tolkien and the Lord of the Rings, 
I mean, Tolkien denied that he put specifically Christian messages into those books, but uh, anybody who's a Christian and reads the books can't help but see, uh, mm -hmm. you know, how his worldview, you know, his faith view just poured into the setting that he created. So uh, that is a nice thing that you can do with fantasy. Now, my, my books are in medieval England, set at a Benedictine Abbey, so I can't get around the religion in my books. But in a fantasy book, you can set this up. And you're right. I think that a non Christian crowd, although you said you've written it for Christians, I, I can see no reason why a non Christian audience wouldn't enjoy it just as much. Definitely. With Lord of the Rings, I completely agree with that too. And I can see where he's coming from because I felt the same way. I was like, okay, I think anyone could open up and read this book and think, okay, this is great. This is a fun story. But at the same time, you can't necessarily take yourself out of the story completely. I mean, I'm the author, everything's through my interpretation of the characters. So obviously, my voice will include some of that in there. Right, right. So what is your advice for parents of teenagers, especially, and youth leaders who work with teenagers? How do they deal with these self-worth issues when they start seeing symptoms of them when they're dealing with these young people? Continue to pour truth. I mean, there's no magic pill. You can't shake a person out of their different stages in life, but you can continue to speak truth in their life and point them to the Bible and get other Christians around you. I mean, we're a family, so get other Christians around you to help pour into their lives and to mentor them. It, I think it's just really important to make sure that even though the culture is completely different than, you know, our Christian culture, that we're making this still a priority in our lives and that we're making other believers a part of it as well. I've noticed right. that now that I'm talking to those girls, they're in college now and they're like, oh yes, I remember this about um, high school or this story. And I'm like, I said that, I don't remember saying that, but for them it was impactful. And I think that is such a blessing for me. I'm like, okay, God use me even in my imperfection to speak to these girls and to help them along. Now, you mentioned that your youth group at some point does separate the boys from the girls and you were working with the girls. Um, I actually went to an all boys high school and we had like an all girls sister school. Can you address maybe a little bit of this idea of same sex education and, and how that might tie into self-worth too? So in our youth group, the way it works is that all the kids, they come in all together. And then because it's pretty big, we would just get our groups together. And when they're younger, it's kind of intimidating to walk into a big room with a hundred other kids. So we would sit, all sit together. We'd all talk and you know, the boys were kind of separate. They had their group. They were all together and we would separate and we'd have conversations that were just, just with the girls and just with the boys. And that's really where everything happens, the relationships. And we're able to be completely honest with each other about what we're feeling because we're going through the same stages. We have a lot of similar uh, stories because we're all in the same stage in the same gender. As much as I protested when my mom told me she was sending me to this all boys high school, I can't help but think, though, that it did allow me to not have to worry about a lot of things that a young person would otherwise worry about if the opposite sex was around. So do you find that your teens are being more honest, that they're able to be more vulnerable even talking about these self-worth issues? Yes, they are definitely. They're able to share their hearts. I mean, sometimes it was just a bland meeting. Other times it's like, okay, we're crying and we're telling each other about something that happened at school. I think it would be different if we were in a bigger crowd. I think it'd be different if there were boys around. I mean, we had different issues. Everyone had their things. It's, I think it's better to, when you're speaking to kids to have a smaller group. And I've noticed that even in my adult life, I have my women's group and we're very open about our issues. We're small, we're open, we're able to speak into each other's lives because we actually do know a little bit more intimate parts of each other's lives. So the Unbetrothed, what age range would you recommend if parents or youth leaders wanted to buy this book for their kids? I think it's PG-13. I meant it for a little bit older teenagers um, and ones also who are into romance, which I think that that's not for every teenager, but I do think it's for a lot of teenagers. That's why I mentioned PG-13. I know that some of my readers also said there was a little bit of violence, not too graphic. I think that's also another reason it was a little bit higher on the scale. For instance, like um, with romance, there's one kiss, um, which some people have issue with. Some people have absolutely no issue with. And they're like, let me get more. But like I said, it's romance. And I never get graphic because I don't think that's right. I mean, you can say something happens without being detailed. Right. And actually, I mean, I know if you say PG-13, I'm wondering, because I see a lot of movies, and uh, I'm, I'm thinking you're really more PG than PG-13, right? Because PG-13, I think there would be, you know, sex and some language and things like that. I'm <laughs> assuming you don't have. Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> but, it probably uh, would be PG in today's standards. I think it's just that it, it depends on where you stand as a parent. 
there's some kids who are 12 years old and completely ready to read and betrothed, then it's perfectly fine. And then there's some 12 year olds who are just more on the innocent side, naive, and they're completely not interested in relationships. So it just depends. Right. What would you say is the most adult theme that they have to deal with in the book? I mean, is there anything like sexual assault or anything really? There's something like minor, that? but it's nothing graphic. Okay. So it's it's more of a sweet romance with a little bit of violence is, is kind of where you're, you're at on that. Yeah. So let's talk about where people can find your book if they want to buy it. You can find it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Christian Books, and you can find it online easily. And if they wanted to learn more about you or, or some of your other projects you might be working on, do you have a website? Yes, I do. It's CandiceYamnitz.com, C-A-N-D-I-C-E-Y-A-M-N-I-T-Z.com. I spell it out because it's really easy to misspell it. And <laughs> trust me, my also... name is Anthony Colank, so I understand. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And you could also find me on Instagram. I'm, a, I'm very active on Instagram. So you could DM me or you could just comment on my post. I'll see them. And I love following people who are commenting and interacting with me. Wonderful. And any uh, parting words for, uh, for especially youth leaders, since you've been working with teens so much, words of wisdom for working with that age group? Say so pray a lot and continue pouring into them, even though you might not see, you know, them responding really well to you today. It isn't necessarily that they aren't responding to you or listening to you. As long as you're loving them and you're there and you're listening ears, you are making a difference if you are prayerfully going into it. It's not about you today and not what's happening today. It could be years from now where you see the fruit. No, and that's so true. And, uh, and I mean, I worked a little bit with youth in a youth group setting and I felt the same way. You don't see it right up front, but you don't know what seeds that you've planted and, and where they're going to come back. So thank you so much, Candice. I wish you all the success on Unbetrothed. This sounds like a wonderful book with wonderful themes and just love having you on the show today. Yes, thank you for having me. All right, I am thrilled to have with me today Carrie Schmidt as a guest reviewer. Carrie is the founder of the blog readingismysuperpower.org and also the co-founder of Just Read Publicity Tours. She does frequent book reviews. She's an avid reader, lives in Georgia with her husband, Eric, and she loves to come on the show and tell us about new and exciting books to read. Carrie, welcome back to The Shepherd's Pie. Thank you so much for having me, Tony. It's always fun to be here. So I understand you brought us a middle grade book today, The League and the Lantern by Brian Wells. Uh, tell us a little bit about that book. The League and the Lantern is so much fun. It's like National Treasure meets Spy Kids. It's about a group of seventh graders. They're having a pre-seventh grade sleepover at a museum in Chicago. A bunch of people invade the museum looking for Abraham Lincoln artifacts. And these three sort of misfits, Jake, Lucy, and TJ. Jake is a young man that's grown up in Chicago. He lives with his uncle, who's his guardian. Lucy is a missionary kid who just recently relocated back to the States. TJ is another seventh grader. He's African-American. He is the source of most of the humor in the novel because, bless his heart, just wants to eat. And there is no time to eat in the 48 hours that they're trying to fight for their own survival, trying to solve this mystery of this crime, and trying to save the day. It's just a lot of fun. Wow. And the author, Brian Wells, this was yes. a debut novel? It was. It was his debut novel. He was, um, I guess still is, a TV producer. And he was just wanting something adventurous for his children to read that would be like movie level quality, something that he would want to put on the screen. He released it and it's done really well. There's been two other books. I believe they're now on audiobook as well. I loved this book as an adult. Haven't been a seventh grader in quite some time. My husband, I gave it to him to read when I was done. He was giggling through the whole thing. I know I keep saying this, but it's just so much fun. It really is. All right. So, yeah, it sounds fun if you've got sort of National Treasure meets Spy Kids. Kids yeah. love those kind of books. Now, the uh, the characters are all going into the seventh grade, I understand. And is that yeah, about the right great. audience for reading it to? I'd say so. Yeah. Uh, sixth, seventh, eighth grade. Like I said, I enjoyed it as an adult. So it's a good thing for families to read together, I think. Okay, now, uh, Brian Wells, obviously a Christian author. How does he yeah. bring Christianity or faith themes into this story? 
Right. So it's very subtle. There are a lot of Bible verses kind of scattered throughout the story, but they end up more as clues to what's going on around them, this battle of good versus evil, that they're trying to figure out who the good guys are, who the bad guys are, why these people were after Abraham Lincoln hat and gloves in the museum. It's also about using the gifts that you have. Jake, Lucy, and Ty have different gifts. So they all have these these great gifts that they've been given. And while they think that they're misfits, they consider themselves misfits, they really have what it takes. They're stronger than they think, and their gifts are used to help others. Jake uh, was really good at putting facts together and remembering history. TJ has a hyper memory, so he comes in very handy when they need to know what's going on and what's happened already and faces. And Lucy is great at martial arts, which uh, Jake and TJ find out accidentally um, when they run into her in the dark museum. (laughs) So uh, they both suffer a little bit for that. So is that idea of the gifts that God has given us and using the gifts Mm -hmm. um, that we have, is that part of the theme that he weaves into the story? Yeah, absolutely. And again, it's very subtle. Just it's something to talk about, you know, with your kids when you're done reading it. It's very much a theme that plays into the bigger events that are going on. Great. So what what did you really love about this book? It's a great blend of humor, of history, mystery, adventure. It's just got everything. It's just really, really well written. Right. And nothing in there that parents of a middle schooler would be worried about. Other than these three seventh graders going from Chicago to Springfield by themselves in the middle of the night, escaping bad guys. No, don't try this at home disclaimer, maybe. All right, great. Carrie, thanks so much for bringing uh, this to our attention. The League and the Lantern by Brian Wells. And uh, just love having you on the show. I love being here. Thanks so much, Tony. That's all the time we have for the show today. We spoke with Candice Pedraza Yamnitz, author of the novel Unbetrothed and the issue of Self-Worth and Teenagers. And in the entertainment segment, Carrie Schmidt reviewed the middle grade novel The League and the Lantern by Brian Wells. Again, this is Anthony Barone Kolank, and this has been The Shepherd's Pie. If any of you listening today have a question for me or a topic you'd like to have us cover on the show, please drop me a line on my website at antonykolenk.com. That's A-N-T-O-N-Y-K-O-L-E-N-C dot com. Also, if you visit my website, you can learn more about my historical fiction series for kids, The Hardwood Mysteries. I'll end, as always, with my wife's favorite scripture quote from Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. May the Lord bless and keep you this week.